All right, welcome to Church in the Wild. I think I figured my mic out this week. I packed a lunch that I'm going to make sandwiches during the sermon. It's going to be a good day. I'm excited. Uh, If you know this, we are on week three of what was supposed to be a one-week sermon called Happy Thanks Living. I think I could probably go 12 weeks and still not cover a lot of the stuff that I found or... We could just go today until like midnight or 1030 at night. We can do that. Um, So those are the options. Like I can keep preaching on this for weeks or you can choose to just let me go ahead, get it all off my chest till midnight, and then we'll go home and get it done in one. If you have a Bible, Psalm chapter 92, Psalm chapter 92, which says this, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto your name, O Most High. To show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery and the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through your works. I will triumph in the work of your hands. O Lord, how great are thy works and your thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knows not this, neither does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass... And when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is they that they shall be destroyed. But thou, O Lord, are most high forevermore. Do you have like a favorite part of the Thanksgiving Day meal? Would you just raise your hand and say there's one part? Okay, a couple of you. Okay, let's do this. How many of you? It is the pumpkin pie. I'm curious. Okay, we got we got a couple. Okay, loud and proud here. Good, good, good. Buy that man a pumpkin pie, somebody. Uh, how about the turkey? Does anybody say, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, it's all right. Uh, how about this? How about stuffing? Is stuffing the part? Okay, okay. How about mashed potatoes and gravy? Anybody? A couple? Okay. How about this? Let's say um, cranberry sauce. Is anybody a cranberry sauce? Uh, Okay. Okay. More than I thought. Good. Good. How about um, green bean casserole? Okay. 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 All right. All right. Good. Good. I love it. I have, um, I have like a, a super just desire to eat Thanksgiving meals. Like (laughs) I just love them. They're so good, right? One thing I love about Thanksgiving day meals is there's something in it that all of us have since probably childhood that we are like, this is my favorite thing. And it's made my favorite way. There's like a secret ingredient in something. Now my aunt used to make punch and every year, I don't know what was in it. Hey, who knows? You never know. I was young, so it had to be legal. But she would make this punch that was so good. And she would never tell the recipe. So when she passed, we don't know how she made it good. We just try to figure it out every year. Like it was just this punch that was better than all the other punches I've had. Now, recently we had a Friendsgiving and we have a man in here who can make cardboard taste better than I can make food taste. Um, he can make cereal better than I can do a steak and he made turkey and Dustin made this turkey and I'm not a huge turkey fan. Like I, I, like I'm like, okay, it's good. But this turkey was like, I couldn't have enough of it. Like I just wanted more and more and more because there's something that he put in the turkey that just made it better. It was like a secret ingredient or done a secret way or certain way that was just better. Recently, we took um, Isla to Panera Bread, and Hurricane Isla ordered mac and cheese. And I, I, I don't really like eat mac and cheese very much, but I tried Panera Bread's mac and cheese, and it was like my grandma came back and made mac and cheese. And I'm like, okay, Panera, you've done it. You've done it. You just you brought all the nostalgia back because they make it with like white cheese. And my grandma used to make mac and cheese with white cheese. And as a kid, I was like, ah, this is all right. But now I'm older and I eat it and I'm like, it's like being seven years old again. And my grandma's sitting there and she's making it. We all have something that we enjoy eating that is made a certain way, that is unique and is what makes it what it is. And I think that relationships are very, very much like food. Think about relationships. They can either be sweet or they can be sour. They can make you want more or want a whole bunch less. They can either fill you up or make you say, ah, no, thank you. They can be good or they can be bad. 
relationships are very similar to food. And what I've noticed about relationships is that gratitude is the secret ingredient that makes a relationship a good relationship. If a relationship is filled with thank you, it will be a great, good, healthy relationship. So think about this story that we read last week. We read Luke chapter 17, and we talked about these 10 men who were lepers. And we pick it up in verse 11. It's worth reading again. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, I want to point out something here. These people culturally are at odds with Jesus. And yet Jesus listens to their cry and gives them mercy and heals them. It's a big deal that Jesus heals them. When he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. So here we have relationship. These people were humble enough to ask for help and obedient enough to do what Christ commanded. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And then verse 16 is fascinating to me. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are there nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Nine of them get healed but only one of them has a relationship. And what is the secret to him developing a relationship with the creator of the universe? Gratitude. God did not make him jump through a bunch of hoops to have a relationship. God did not make him go, hey, I'll tell you what, you walk, you tell 10 people about me, you change your clothes, you do this, you do this, you do this, you can come back and you can sit at my feet and I can teach you. He just simply was grateful And the relationship with God began. Gratitude is the secret ingredient. So we learned in the first week that gratitude gives us joy. It fights anxiety and it brings literal health to our bodies and our minds. Then last week we talked about how it brings us contentment. And this week we're going to point out a couple things about gratitude. First of all, gratitude fights comparison. Gratitude fights comparison. Craig Rochelle said this, if you want to destroy something special, start comparing it to something else. Think about that for a minute. What are we so often guilty of doing? We are so guilty so often of comparison in our lives. And this is not a new trap from the enemy. The enemy is not throwing a brand new trap at you when he gets you to start comparing your wife to somebody else's wife. He, he, had, he had Adam and Eve begin to compare their relationship. Oh, did God really say that? Does God really want the best for you? Does he really think he has your best in mind? Comparison is an age-old trap. And here's how it works in our life. We begin to, out of either insecurity or pride, we begin to compare ourselves with others we begin to compare our person with other people so i knew someone one time who i had a good relationship with for a while and then eventually i noticed it started getting like sour and this guy was a friend of mine but he started like saying things about me and then he started saying things to me and then i would hear things that he would say about me to other people and finally we had to go to him and his girlfriend at the time and say would you please stop telling this guy that jason does this and so he should too because it's causing comparison and it's destroying our relationship and is going to destroy yours because comparison is an absolute trap And when we begin our relationships out of a spot of gratitude, rather than out of, well, I want to know, I want to make sure you love me as much as you love them. You didn't say this to me, but you said this to them. You didn't do this, but you did this for them. Or you know what? You're not doing this good enough. When we begin to compare, it's a trap that begins to tear away and destroy good things. Think about how how God said it in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 
Not that we dare to classify or commit, compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. So he said, there are people who are commending themselves. They are saying, oh yeah, well, look at me. I gave this much. I did this. I did this. I did this. These would be the influencers of the day. They're very big into like, look at what I did. And the Bible says we should not dare to classify or compare ourselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Good relationships do not compare their relationships to others, and a good marriage does not compare its spouse to other spouses. If you want to destroy the relationship that God gave you, start comparing your spouse to someone else. You want to destroy your relationships at church, start comparing how they interact with you versus others. But gratitude instead fights that because gratitude speaks up and says, oh, well, listen, I know they did this for me and they did this for me and I'm thankful for that and I'm thankful for that and I'm thankful for that. I I recently, I just talked to a pastor and he has a church much larger than ours. And he was talking to me about, man, I'm really grateful that you post pictures of your baptisms online because we barely ever have baptisms. Like every couple of years, we might have one or two. And he said, but then I began to like be kind of angry at you. Like, well, why is God reaching people through him and not me? And I said, well, you got to be careful what you wish for. I've had a year that's just crazy chaotic, right? As the enemy just attacks me and attacks me and attacks me and attacks me. So if you want to compare that, you should always look at the backstory of what's going on behind the scenes. But he was like comparing churches, and that's such an easy trap for us. However, comparison only brings pride or envy. There is such a natural desire to compare, but it never brings us to the conclusion that we want to have. We sometimes think, well, if I compare, I'll feel better about myself. But comparison only has two ends. One is, yep, I am so much better than everybody else because I do this and they don't, or, man, I just wish that God would treat me like he treats them. I wish that people would treat me like they treat so-and-so. It only arrives at pride or discontent. But number two, gratitude guards against envy. It guards against envy. I'm going to read you a paragraph from a man named Paul David Tripp. I've read this paragraph every day for the last two weeks. And every time I read it, it's like more profound to me. So if you're looking for it, I can share this with you after the sermon, but it's too long to write up here. He said this, envy does something that is spiritually deadly. It assumes that no one else, it assumes understanding that no one else has. Envy not only assumes that you know more, about another person's life than you could ever know. But it also assumes that you have a clearer understanding of what is best than God does. Here's what happens in our life. God, why are you doing this to me and not them? Is us saying, God, I know what's best for me more than you do. Thank you for creating the universe, but I know what's best for me. Furthermore, envy causes you to forget God's amazing rescuing, transforming, empowering, and delivering grace. You become so occupied with accounting for what you do not have that the enormous blessings of God's grace, blessings that we could never have earned, achieved, or deserved, go unrecognized and uncelebrated. What a powerful paragraph. What he's saying is when we begin to compare ourselves we begin to become envious of others. And all of a sudden, what we do is, God, why didn't you give me that person's spouse? God, why don't I have a person in my life? You gave them and they don't deserve one. Why didn't you give me one? God, why isn't my family like their family? God, why aren't I like this? And we begin to think that we know more about them than they do. And we also begin to think that we know more than God does. But the ultimate destruction that envy causes is we forget that for some unknown reason, the person who spoke eternity into existence 
was willing to hang on a cross and die specifically for us. And when we begin to be envious of, well, they have this car, they have this, they have this, they have this house, they have this coffee machine, they wear these clothes, we forget about the nails that went into the hands of our Savior. And grace is thrown out the window. And gratitude fights against this envy. Gratitude instead says, God, thank you for saving me. I have no idea how you could love me, but thank you, Jesus. And the more grateful we are, the better. Proverbs 14.30 says this, A tranquil heart gives life to flesh, listen to this, but envy makes the bones rot. It literally destroys us when we look at other people's social media and say, I wish I was where they are. I wish they, I wish I had what they had. I wish I could go where they're going. I wish I, it literally destroys us. James 3.14 says this, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. This wisdom comes not from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Job chapter 5 verse 2 says, Surely vexation kills the fool, and jealousy slays the simple. What's interesting to me is the man who wrote this, went, the man who said these words when he said it had lost all of his family, all of his money, all of his health, all of his friends, besides just a couple of them who were critical of him, and his wife who told him, you should just curse God and die. He had no one else in his life at this point, and he says jealousy is what slays the simple. But thirdly, gratitude leads to generosity. 2 Corinthians 9.11 says this, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The man who penned those words also said this in Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now rejoice is a really interesting Greek word. It's a very interesting word. It's used 11 times, and it means being consciously glad for grace, to experience God's grace and favor, to be consciously glad for that grace, and it is the word that we, it's called charette, it is the word that we get called charity. And the Greeks would use this word and say, if I consciously think about how good God is to me, the byproduct is I will automatically be generous to anyone I encounter. And they would use this word as a hello or a goodbye, we say, what's up? How you doing? Whatever we say, they would say this word, rejoice. And the word rejoice literally means that I am consciously choosing to be aware that God is good to me, and that action promotes me to be generous to anyone and everyone I know. Some of the most happy people I have ever met in my life are generous people, and when I find out why they're generous, they are almost always grateful. You start asking them, how, how could you do this? How could you give this? How could you be that? Well, see, God did this for me, and I have this person in my life, and I'm grateful. The idea of that word is that this, if we are consciously thoughtful of the grace, we will by default become charitable to others that God has placed in our life. And that man who used that is the, is the man Paul, and he said in Philippians, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Last week we talked about this. We talked about you got to meditate on miracles. You have to master your memory. David said, I will recall what God has done. And literally the idea of the word recall is I will recall it into my mind. I will make myself dwell on the miracles. It's not being fake. It's being disciplined to say, I will choose to think about what God has done for me. It's self-discipline. And when we begin to meditate on miracles, we begin to be grateful for what God has done. So I talked to you last week about how I eat oranges, and if I'm discouraged, I eat an orange because I remember how great of a gift of a miracle it was that on a Christmas Eve, God gave us oranges. 
when we had nothing. And so when I'm discouraged, I meditate on the miracles. Truthfully, gratitude is the secret ingredient to a good, healthy relationship. Gratitude fights envy, it fights comparison, and it is generous. If you think of how a good, healthy relationship exists, it exists without jealousy and comparison, and it is always generous to each other. Think about when your relationship is at its absolute best, you have no problem going and buying something that your wife wants. But when things are kind of hard, it's a little bit harder to make time to stop at the Starbucks because, well, the line was long. Well, this was wrong. This is going on. And so the more grateful we are, the better our relationship will be. But I want to show you what I mean. So I brought Thanksgiving leftovers. Do you like Thanksgiving leftovers? Okay, okay. At our house, growing up, we had Thanksgiving meal. Then we would go outside. We would either have a snowball fight or we would play, you know, out in the barn. We would do some chores. And then the men would go deer hunting and then we would do all this other stuff. We would watch some, some old movies. It's a Wonderful Life usually came up on Thanksgiving Day. We always watched, we have one tradition that it still exists to this day, and that is we watch the Lions lose. Uh, it's just every year they, they manage to lose on Thanksgiving Day, and we watch that game like, hey, here we go, the Lions are going to lose. But we watch that, and then that night... <laughs> yes, that night we watch, we watch a movie and we make sandwiches. We make these sandwiches out of all the leftovers, and we grew up with very little, so that Thanksgiving meal gets extended for like 10 days as we eat these sandwiches over and over and over. So I brought some things. We eat mustard. I believe some of you like mayonnaise. We eat mustard. Cranberry sauce. We got stuffing. We have some mashed potatoes. We have sweet potatoes. Some people call them yams. And we got turkey and cheese, right? So these things are all good, right? Like they're all very good. And I can put all these things together and I can put them on a plate and I can enjoy them. They're good. I have a good time with them. Do you guys put mashed potatoes on your sandwiches? It, yeah, okay, all right. How about stuffing? Do you put stuffing? Yeah, do you put sweet potatoes? Does anybody do that? No, okay, all right. I can put all of this together. It's, it's so good. That's a lot of cranberry sauce. That's not going to be good. That's not going to be good. <laughs> There's mashed potatoes. This is really good. But is it a sandwich? No. It's just good food. It's just le it's leftovers. What does it need to be a sandwich? It needs bread. It needs bread. So let's talk about bread for a minute. To me, bread represents how every relationship should begin and end each and every day. In order for a good sandwich to be a sandwich, it requires bread. And in order for a good relationship to be a relationship, it requires gratitude. The thing about gratitude is I can be grateful for and I can have what's called, I think we called it an open face sandwich. I think that's what we called it. It's essentially half of a sandwich. Just like when you were out of bread, you just put the heel down and then you put the potatoes on top. That's what you did. But I need two pieces of bread for a sandwich. And here's what most of us do in our life. Most of us, including myself, I am often grateful for, but I am not grateful to. This is my struggle. I am so grateful to God. God, thank you for the people in my life. Thank you for bringing them. And I'll probably never tell them how much they mean to me. Or I'm grateful too, but not grateful for. I'll tell them, hey, thanks so much. But to God, I'm like, why are they such a headache? And this is how most of our lives work. I can't even begin to make this into an actual sandwich. There's so much food. Most of our lives work and our relationships are not good, healthy relationships because we don't begin and we don't end with gratitude. So a key ingredient is missing and we can't figure out why our relationship is not as good as it should be, but we're literally trying to eat sandwiches without the bread. It's like trying to eat pumpkin pie without pumpkins 
at some point. You need some something that has pumpkin in it at some point. And what we do in our relationships is we can't figure out why they're not good, why they're not healthy, why they're not happy, why they're sour, why they're not sweet, why it only tastes like mashed potatoes and nothing else, but we failed to bring gratitude for and gratitude to into our relationships. So I wrote down some ideas. We're going to try to implement them in our lives, and I hope that you will try as well. You can make a list of reasons that you are thankful for someone and read it on Thanksgiving Day. You can write on a piece of paper anonymously. You ever play that game fishbowl, the glass bowl, and you put all the paper in there? How about this Thanksgiving? You write anonymously without your name a reason for you why you are thankful for everybody in the room. You drop it in there, and before you eat Thanksgiving dinner, you read everything in the glass bowl. You can start a Thanksgiving journal each year and open the journal the next year. So at, at, the be- at the end of this year, you write everything you're thankful for and you save it all the way till next Thanksgiving. And next Thanksgiving, you open it up and read it together. There is um, where we go on vacation. There's something called a Hess Lake journal. And what they do is people who go, they write everything down in it. And it's super cool to read like what people in the 70s talked about. Like, oh, we had roast beef. Like, great. But they were super happy for it. You can start your Thanksgiving day by telling everyone that you are thankful for them and then end it by doing the same. But the idea is that we should always begin our relationships with gratitude. The reason we struggle so much with jealousy, comparison, envy, anger, is because we forget all the reasons we have to be grateful for the people who God put us around. So this year at Thanksgiving, as we eat our Thanksgiving lunches, as we eat our Thanksgiving dinners, or if you're like me and you eat a Thanksgiving sandwich for the next two weeks, let's not allow Thanksgiving to go by without saying thank you for the people and thank you to the people who God has brought into our life. Oh, well, I don't want to be fake. I can't find any reason to be thankful for. You're not looking hard enough. It's not being fake. It's just being disciplined. It's just a matter of looking until you find a reason to be thankful for that person who is going to say that thing that you know they're going to say this Thanksgiving. You know it's coming. You know you're going to be halfway through your meal and they're going to be, what do you think about politics? And that whole conversation goes that way. You know it's coming. Cut them off by, well, I think this. I think that I'm super grateful for you, and I'm glad that you have a different opinion than me, and I'm grateful that we live in a country where we can have different opinions, and I'm really grateful that God allowed us, people a long time ago, to find this country, and you begin the conversation with gratitude. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up here today. I know this is a little bit of a different sermon, but there's one relationship that I think we all can be grateful for. There is one relationship that if you are a child of God, you can begin every day and end every day with, man, I am so thankful for you. And I've found the more grateful I am for God and to God, the more grateful I become for my spouse and my daughter and to my spouse and my daughter. I become grateful for my in-laws a lot more easily after worship, after just songs of, oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. It's a lot easier to thank Aunt May for bringing green bean casserole. And the more grateful I am to God, the more grateful I become to others. So I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you a couple questions today.